there's a real, there's a very impressive range of expertise in the room today, um, including from among people who are not speaking. And thank you very much for coming. We could easily have filled this room twice over with people, and for that reason, we're webcasting the event. Uh, so if you do ask a question, although we won't have much time for questions, because we have a very packed schedule, uh, but if you do ask a question, it will of course be webcast. So I have to just warn you of that. Notice that downstairs are the cloakrooms, and upstairs is the library where we will be having coffee breaks and lunch and a wine reception at the end of the day. And I really hope you'll all be able to stay for the wine reception, because that, that is where a lot of the questions and answers can happen that we've not had time for during the day. Now, bags are not allowed in the library because it's a very valuable collection. They need to be left either in the meeting room here or downstairs, please. If there is a fire, the exit is the entrance that we came in. And if you are down in the basement, there is a fire exit from the basement. And the meeting point is we turn uh, right down Piccadilly and just outside the Burlington Arc. If you are tweeting the conference, and we welcome uh, tweets, please could you do it to the hashtag FraxBack or AshDieBack. And if you need Wi-Fi, there are details at the front here. There's a very complex password, so I won't give it out now, but perhaps during the coffee break, you could get the password. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce for our opening address the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the Natural Environment and Science, Lord de Morley. Lord de Morley is the re Minister responsible for the affairs of DEFRA, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, in the House of Lords. And uh, the issue of tree health is one that lies within his portfolio. And in addition, he has responsibility for other areas of interest to uh, people in the audience today, including uh, national parks, areas of outstanding natural beauty, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem services, uh, etc. So it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much for coming to address us this morning, Lord de Morley. Richard, thank you. Very much indeed. Good morning, everyone, and a, a very warm welcome to London on a rather uh, crisp December. Are we through de into December yet? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, November, late November day. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to join you uh, for this really important event on Kalara, uh, organised by the Praxback EU expert group. It's, it's really encouraging to see so many uh, uh, people here who know so much about the subject. Uh, r rather a surprise for a parliamentarian to be amongst so many knowledgeable people. Uh, um, opportunities like this for, um, to give us the, the sort of space and time to have uh, discussions uh, to share knowledge and expertise are, uh, don't come along that often. And uh, the, the fact that this meeting is being held here at the Linnean Society today is particularly appropriate um, because this is the world's oldest biological society. Founded in 1788, uh, its members are from a full range of professions with an interest in natural history uh, who come together to communicate new advances in their fields. I really appreciate you, uh, Richard, inviting me here today to talk to you on the important subject of Kalara and uh, plant health more generally and uh, uh, I'm talking about how the government is working in conjunction with others uh, to address these problems. So why has plant health risen up the agenda? Uh, it's now one of my department's top four priorities and it also contributes to two other of those priorities, those of improving the environment and growing the rural economy. Some of us will recall, and, and indeed Rimbis and I were discussing earlier, uh, the impact of Dutch elm disease. Uh, others will remember public awareness campaigns about Colorado beetle back in the 1970s. But since then, plant health has probably not impinged to any great extent on the public consciousness. Last year, Colara changed that. And as a result, the general public are all much more aware 
of the threats to our trees and woodlands from pests and diseases. Uh, and government has redoubled its efforts in this area. Despite the fact that the United Kingdom has less forest cover than many other EU countries, Kalara highlighted the cultural value the British public place on our trees and forests. Our approach to Kalara has benefited, benefited from the European experience of the disease in drawing together our evidence to frame our response to it. We drew heavily on the expertise, experience and research from both this country and mainland Europe. We published our Kalara management plan in March this year and the focus of our approach is on managing the spread. We know, based on what has happened in your countries, that we can't stop Kalara in its tracks. But there are things we can do to stop its, or to slow its spread. Our plan sets out four objectives aimed to reduce the impact of the disease. These are slow the spread, identify resistance in the ash population, encourage citizen, landowner and industry involvement, and build resilience in UK woodland and associated industries. is an important component to our approach. We know from Denmark's experience that it may be possible to find a small population that are resistant. Screening trials to look for resistant stock began earlier this year. Over 150,000 saplings obtained from commercial nurseries have now been planted at 14 sites uh, along the east of England. We've also commissioned research to support each of the Kalara management plan objectives. We're improving our models and providing better biological data for them. We are also looking at possible treatments for Kalara, and by the end of this year we're expecting to have some indication of which products from 14 shortlisted from a long list of about 100 might be most effective. We've initiated a programme to identify and develop resistance in UK ash provenances, working closely with European colleagues. And you'll be hearing about some of this work today. Uh, in addition, DEFRA, the Forestry Commission and others from the research councils and the devolved administrations are taking forward a strategic research initiative on tree health and plant biosecurity under our uh, Living with Environmental Change Partnership. And projects are due to start early next year. Uh, I mentioned citizens. Citizens have a, an important role to play in protecting plant health. We're exploring ways in which we can involve the public and volunteers to help us detect, monitor and support work on plant health. We're developing a tree health early warning system. This is designed to engage those citizens and volunteers directly in early detection and monitoring of tree pests and diseases. Over the next four months, work will continue and further evidence will be drawn on in preparation for the next iteration of our management plan, which will be published in March. As well as Kalara, of course, we're facing other challenges, such as Phytophthora remorum and oak processionary moth. We're also concerned about pests and pathogens beyond our shores, such as sweet chestnut blight. The ideal, of course, is to keep pests out of Europe altogether, and we're supporting EU initiatives on pests such as emerald ash borer and bronze birch borer. The potential impact on our landscape if we fail to take these threats seriously will be incalculable. That's why we've made safeguarding plant health one of my department's top priorities and why my Secretary of State, Owen Patterson, has asked our Chief Scientific Advisor, Professor Ian Boyd, to convene the independent task force which drew together evidence from at home and abroad 
and identified what we might do to improve the way we respond to current and future threats. They've considered how we assess and manage risks at national level, how we secure improvements within the EU and internationally, and how we share information and develop capability. We've already committed to take early action on two of the task force's recommendations, to produce a prioritized risk register and to improve our approach to contingency planning. These are fundamental to everything else we might do. We need to understand what the risks are and have an agreed approach to managing them. And we need to have robust plans in place to tackle pests when they do arrive. We've shared a preliminary version of the risk register with stakeholders and we'll be publishing it in January. We're also in the process of appointing a new Chief Plant Health Officer and we'll be responding in full to the report of the task force before the end of the year. Its report is very clear, however, that government alone cannot tackle the many threats to plant health. We need to build strong partnerships with a wide range of groups, industry, academia, environmental groups, and the public. In the longer term, one of our biggest opportunities to make a difference will come in our negotiations of the new EU plant health law. Proposals were published on the 6th of May. The new, more proactive approach to assessing and managing risk set out in the proposals chimes with the task force's recommendations and is very welcome. Those of you here today understand the importance of learning from each other's experience on Kalara. In line with one of our task force recommendations about sharing intelligence from abroad, we are looking forward to hearing from you, uh, from the, you the experts, about, for example, the current situation with ash regeneration in Latvia, the impact of ash dieback on veteran trees in Sweden, and disease management in nurseries and nursery stock in Germany, to name but a few. Today's meeting will allow us to share our knowledge, build new collaborations, and apply newfound wisdom to combating the diseases and threats to our trees and woodlands across Europe. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, I've, I'm looking forward to a very interesting day. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Minister for those uh, words, and we're very grateful to the Government for its very uh, proactive approach to um, plant health issues. Now, Rimvis Bisaitis is the a coordinator and main leader of the Fraxback group, and he'll now say a few words about the spread of ash dieback in Europe. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank Richard for organizing effort. And uh, now I will make a brief talk about the uh, spread of the disease uh, in Europe, some uh, historical aspects. and. So, as you probably know, from the beginning we started to see uh, the disease symptoms uh, in the early mid 90s. Uh, and I believe that you have seen this already in your country. And then we didn't know anything uh, what's going on. So it was clear, though, that it's a lethal disease because it's uh, able to kill the big trees. Actually, what we was observed from the very beginning that there was no correlation with tree age, soil, environment, uh, because the disease was taking everything where the ash was growing. And it was massive tree death as a result. I will show a little bit about uh, geographic spread. And currently, the disease is observed uh, over larger parts of Europe. And the impact is really serious because, for example, in Sweden, the species ash is uh, included in uh, the Red Data Book. 
since 2010. So basically, uh, what we know also that you cannot get rid of it, you cannot eradicate it. Instead, you must learn to live with it. And that's uh, the one of the aims of uh, meeting our meeting today. So just about the spread. So it was in mid-early 90s that we started to see the ash trees dying. Then late 90s, early 2000, mid 2000, late, the first uh, decade of uh, 2000, and then uh, 2011, and then bang, bang. So here we are. So basically, uh, once again, just to see how it goes. Uh, so now, at, as I mentioned, from the beginning we didn't know anything that was going on, but now we know the origin of the fungus. It's native in the Far East, in Japan, and uh, uh, Manchuria, and it grows on decomposed leaves of Manchurian ash. And uh, the species has been described, it, it has two names, one is Halara, which is very popular, maybe similar to cholera, and another is quite uh, complicated. So halara is good for use. And it has, uh, this fungus has potential to spread with plant material, and uh, it has, as you probably noticed, quite high potential in spreading with airborne spores. So as we have the disease in many countries, uh, the idea was to launch the coordination action, or cost action, as the research is going on, many countries have their national uh, projects, so the uh, EU is uh, concerned that all these things should be coordinated just to avoid duplicate and uh, to have complementarity instead. So currently we have many countries, it's one of the largest actions and there are more flags by now than in this uh, picture. And we have partners also from China, Russia and Ukraine. And that was all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rinvis. Now, the plan of campaign for the next part of the day is to start in the far east of Europe and then work our way uh, west. So our next speaker is from Lithuania, Remvis Vatis, on uh, forest generation uh, under forest regeneration under Lithuania's policy of, of felling uh, to try to stop the spread, initially try to stop the spread of cholera by felling. Good morning, everyone. I'm Remis Bakis from Lithuanian State Forest Service. And today I would like to present our results from survey on forest health regeneration and clear felled areas uh, previously uh, dominated by common ash. Asirimis already showed us uh, uh, ash dieback started in Lithuania in mid 90s. And today the majority of, uh, of uh, stands and uh, landscape trees are subjected to various degree of damage. On the other hand, today we have opportunity to see what happens in the, in the ash sites with a long disease history. Uh, before the ash dieback, um, the area dominated by common ash comprised 2.7% of total forested area in the country. According to official numbers, today we have only 1.7%. Moreover, we suspect that the situa real situation might be even worse because uh, our national forest inventory is carried out repeatedly every 10 years and probably the real situation is to be evaluated in the nearest future. <coughs> the area of damage at ash stands increased dramatically since 2000 as the disease uh, spread rapidly over the country. Later on, the numbers of the infected area shows in the graph decreased just because of um, uh, felling, uh, to which 
the infected area dominated by ash were subjected. These spellings were quite intense during the last decade, and uh, today we're calculating nearly 30,000 hectares of, of clear cellus area. Today, uh, the ash diebreak is not, go not going to slow down. Uh, as you can see now uh, in this graph, showing the results of uh, stationary survey plots uh, placed in the remaining ash stands, uh, about 10% of ash trees are dying out every year. So, long story short, according to um, the um, reports of forest owner and our own evaluations, we have virtually any stand disease today in the country, uh, and the numbers of remaining uh, viable and, and fruiting ash trees are extremely low, and thus we have a quite poor self-regeneration of common ash. Uh, the diebacks is not very unusual thing in forestry. Uh, caused by various pests and diseases were starting here and there quite regularly and usually are caused by local, uh, local pathogens. But the uh, majority of them starts and ends at certain point. And to date, after almost 20 years of, of Colorado Dibe history, we have no improvement in the country and the question raised are sharp and, and ported as never before. And this question are, uh, what should forest owners should do with, 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 with infected stands. Uh, are there any silviculture measures available to improve the situation? And does the possibility exist that uh, uh, common ash juveniles will partially survive in the clear cuts on, or reforestation? And most important question today in our country, if, it not, if it's not, if it's not possible to save ash, uh, uh, what species may come in these sites if they were left unmanaged? Why natural regeneration of uh, common ash is so important today? Because since the year 2000 in, in Lithuania, uh, ash was not planted in the forestry sector due to economical and sanitary consideration. On the, other, on, on the other hand, every vital and fruiting and promising tree were left as the retention tree in the clear size to support self-regeneration. Such policy, however, proved uh, like a very limited success because the absolute majority of such retention trees just died out uh, just after several years after fellings. The offsprings uh, usually fade the same fate, uh, meet the same fate, and this is uh, very, very much uh, contrasting with the uh, situation just several decades ago when ash was also not planted in the forestry sector just because uh, uh, the self-regeneration happened in vast numbers. And the ash seedlings and the uh, ash juveniles are dying out as much as our parents, no matter what they are seedlings or sprouts from the stumps. In this study, we focused on the clear cut to look closely on self-regeneration of forest. Uh, focusing on ash. To do that, we selected 20 uh, clear-cut sites of various age between one to 10 growing season after fellings. They are located in two geographic locations in the Lithuania. All these sites uh, before fellings were dominated by ash. Uh, since sanitary clear fellings, no clearings or other, other sort of management were undertaken in these sites. Uh, in all these clear cuts, uh, the site conditions are very favorable for ash growth. Uh, 
in the very beginning, after clear cut, uh, after clear felling, uh, in evaluated clear cuts, a dense grass cover was present in all uh, investigated sites. However, this dense grass cover did not prevent that many tree species from tree species from successful self regeneration. The question is, what what role did play common ash in this self regeneration? To answer that, uh, transects, three meter wide transects were plotted in the investigated clear cuts. These transects covered two to three percent of total area. Within these transects, all um, trees and shrubs were evaluated by, by measuring the high density and health condition. Additionally, inside and outside uh, these transects in the clear cuts, all, uh, all stumps of common ash uh, were evaluated as well as they were evaluated the, the, the sprouts uh, growing from these stumps if they were present. <coughs> As a result, we counted more than 8,000 uh, tree juveniles and nearly 1,400 air stumps. And among these numbers, ash comprised only 775 uh, seedlings and, ash, uh, and stumps from a sprout. Sprout from a stump, sorry. Uh, in, the dif in the clear cuts of different age, that there was uh, a clear distinction between uh, abundance of um, ash uh, uh, originating from seeds and ash growing from stumps as a sprout. In the fresh clear cuts, uh, the sprouts uh, comprise 36% of all ash regeneration, but gradually disappeared uh, in the older clear cuts. This might be explained about uh, a lifespan due to color infection is quite short, and uh, the sprouts are dying off gradually together with the stumps, which are decayed with time, while the uh, number of seedlings uh, can be and partially is replaced by the seeds of surrounding uh, trees. But in this light, the importance of sprouting from stumps is not important, in, uh, as it's not poten it has no potential for, for, for the process of ash regeneration. Uh, irrespective to age of the clear cuts, uh, all self regeneration was dominated by fast growing pioneer species like uh, grey alder, uh, betula species, and in some occasion common aspen. Uh, this is not untypical uh, because uh, vast openings, as the clear cuts are vast openings, are usually occupied by fast growing pioneer species. What is unusual in this situation uh, this is the very low numbers of ash regeneration, which is marked in the graph as the middle grow color, middle gray color. The ratio between fraction uh, of, of common ash in the stand species composition before and after the fellings showed a, a, a very, very big decrease of the ash proportion due to very poor, poorly uh, happening uh, self-regeneration. Of course, this might be explained by the absence of management, but this is very, very evident that uh, the potential of ash self-regeneration is, is much lower than that reported several decades ago. In this picture, uh, uh, you can see a two very typical uh, species shift occasions we found in investigated clear cuts where uh, common ash marked as the red color is being replaced by a fast growing species like a, a gray alder or birch. Moreover, uh, common ash proved to be uh, among the slowest growing uh, tree species in the investigated clear cuts it was easily outcompeted by gray alder, birch, and aspen. Uh, this is especially true in the oldest sites, uh, implying what uh, the 
common Azure regeneration in the older size is younger than, than the Azure generation in the remaining size. Uh, this means that in the future, due to uh, between species competition for light, the numbers of remaining cache will decrease even more. Uh, among all investigated ash juveniles, 90% uh, were dead, 54% were deceased, and only 29% were sound looking. Uh, in other words, the health condition were unsatisfying and implying that the current state of ash generation simply cannot, uh, uh, cannot form the recovery of of the, the stance where ash would be dominating species. Uh, there was clear differences between health condition from ash originating from seeds and the ash pr sprouting from stumps. The health condition of ash originating from seeds was much better than, than that sprouting from the stumps. This would support theory but uh, Mm. These ash seedlings, healthier ash seedlings, were originating from surrounding trees, which are indeed uh, of better health conditions and of better resistance to the disease, since they are not they were not subjected to sanitary clear fellings. Uh, this pointing to uh, what the what the selection work and the selection of breeding material may be of the utmost importance. Uh, trying to recover and, and conserve it as, a, as a species. We can conclude that uh, without and even with uh, so the cultural measures in investigated areas, the recovery of ash stand is not possible because the incidence of ash regeneration is low, health is poor, and the growth is slow. Uh, Ash is being replaced by fast-growing cray alder, bear species, and common aspen. On the other hand, uh, some of our results and the ongoing work in Europe shows that the selection is, should be considered as the very important mean for ash recovery and conservation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Remis. I think we have time for a few quick questions. As we don't have a roaming microphone, I will try to repeat the question so that it uh, gets onto the webcast. Yes. How expensive was it to remove the ash trees from the forests in the sanitary fellings? I really cannot say if, if, how expensive it is, but uh, if forest companies want to grow something in these sites, they are very, very like to remove the trees and plant something else instead of ash. They consider this a better commercial opportunity. But uh, I cannot tell you about cost of removing them logs from certain sites. Any other questions about the Lithuanian experience? Yes? Is it possible that the stumps and the sprouts, that the disease is still present in the stumps, and that's why the sprouts still exist in the area? As the disease is airborne, I don't think that, uh, that the health condition of, of stumps uh, play a major role. Of, of course, it can prevent stumps from sprouting, but the stu stump, uh, sprouts are dying not because they can the stumps. We are pretty sure about that. Eric. Uh, so a question about the, the policy. Is it a official policy to, to remain, to, to leave the health of trees, or is it just something that is being done uh, they, they are, these are more recommendation than official policy. But if we are speaking about state forestry sector, uh, there is a thin line between recommendation and official policy. <laughs> and as for private owners, they, they can do whatever you want, actually. 
Well, thank you very much. So now we'll move on to uh, Latvia. We're very grateful. We're very grateful to Talis Geitnex for coming to speak about the uh, Latvian situation. Dear organizers of the meetings, dear colleagues, I would like to inform you about our results, about natural regeneration of mining ash stands in Latvia. Latvia are a very rich country, we forest. Forest covers more than 50% for total area of Latvia. But main three species are Scotch pine, birch, and Norway spruce. Current situation with ash, as you see, is not so much, but anyway, historically, it's important for, Latvia, for, 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 Lat for Latvian forestry. The first serious disease symptoms was observed in, sorry, in beginning of millennium. Uh, there is a border, you see, with our good friends and neighbors with Lithuania. 2006, much more. Uh, this picture is very similar to the picture with Rimmis show or already, but it's in larger scale. This is situation in 2009. Austrian colleagues, Thomas Kirisic, also was working very hard in Latvia. Thank you very much. And, and much, much more these disease symptoms was observed in younger stands. In this picture, you, you see the diagram how decreases the total area of ash stands in Latvia. About ongoing work, we are estimating ash dieback dynamic uh, to see the change of plant species in declining ash stands and to see what happened with natural regeneration of ash. It was established 20 permanent plots in Latvia in 2005. Each plot has circle-shaped form. In each plot we measure all parameters of, tree, of trees. We estimate it dieback, crown defolation, also epicormic branches, and all information what we can get in all in, in these small plots. Uh, practically, it looked like each tree was marked in this plot. But inside in this small plot, in this plot, it was established three smaller plots. And in this smaller plot, we estimated also vegetation and shrubs. And the second monitoring was in 2010. The first, it seems more dramatically <coughs> declining of ash stand was in beginning of millennium. <coughs> now it seems is less damages in the forest, but I think it's uh, 
more uh, the reason is the ashes who die, they die, and now it's, of course, it seems the, the, the situation is better, but it's not better, unfortunately. The situation is different when we see a mixture of broad-leaved trees. In relatively healthy stems, Aster platanoides, Quercus and Ulmus, it comes together with this ash who survive. But in heavily infected stems, it comes Populus tremula and from shrubs, especially Padus avium. In this picture, you see dynamic in relatively healthy stems, 2005 and 2010. But in this picture, you see very heavily infected sample plot, 2005, 2010. Practically, it looks this, the, you, you, you see this picture in the forest. About ash woodstock, of course, in this stand, which is, you no, know, we call it as healthy, but it's relatively healthy, the crisis of ash stock is much, much smaller if you compare with this minus sign, which is the other plot. When we compare the other major trees, as I said, Populus tremula. But Populus tremula, you know, it's very expensive, very, very expansive. When, 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 popula, when Populus is presented, when you cut it, then uh, this protein, this comes very, very fast. No, maybe uh, I cannot tell 100% this Populus is, is an indicator uh, for this heavily infected stand. But, but uh, if you see, for example, for example, Quercus, Ulmus, it's much more presented in healthy stand. About young trees, young trees, which means uh, the high is less than five meters. As I said, Populus, uh, tremola. It's very, uh, it comes very fast in this infected stand. About the shrubs, it's interesting, Corillus avellana, it looks like indicator for healthy condition, but as we know in coniferous forest, when we find Corillus avellana or Sorbus alcuparia, it's very good indicator for, for heterobasbion. But in this case, it it's looks this um, Corillus avellana, it comes more in healthy stand. But this shrubs, from one hand, it maybe could be as indicator, but from the other hand, as more shrubs, it cannot, it's, it decreases the natural regeneration because the shrubs take the light and ash, ash uh, natural regeneration is going not so good. Uh, there is a picture from sample plot where we found a lot of uh, infected ash. It's near this sample plot My colleagues, Natalie Akhipova, who works more with this disease, she found a lot of young ash who is also, she, we can observe the symptoms of disease. And also in coniferous stand, we, when we observe natural regen regeneration, it seems uh, ash is good together with Pinus silvestris in some places. In wet places, 
Also, almost glutinosa, but in, it, of course it's in wet places. When we summarize our results, I should tell it's only preliminary, preliminary results, because we have 20 plots. It's only two times investigations. But anyway, at the moment it seems Ash in mixed stands. Ash mixed together with Quercus, Acer platenoides, Ulmus. <coughs> this seems what we can say today. Ash in mixed stands. No, we should be optimistic because this Ash was healthy at least in 2006. And it, which, which, which means we have some potential for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, very much. Are there any questions uh, arising from that talk? So now we'll take quite a jump across uh, Europe to the situation in Austria uh, with uh, Thomas Karistis uh, from Vienna. remote control so then I can if, if it will work immediately without moving the uh, thank you Richard um, thank you for, for the invitation to speak at this meeting Dear Lord Dimoni, dear colleagues from the UK and Ireland, dear Fraxby colleagues, uh, I will not speak in my presentation too much about Austria or the situation in Austria. The idea of my talk is rather to give you a broad overview, a synthesis, <coughs> review of the disease cycle of H. Cybex, or to put it more generally on H. Cybex in general. important information for managing the disease. And I tried also to include some information, some new information um, regarding the
some of the extra types, some some of the extra stagings that it may then introduce to use. At that time, you see here by the way the stages. This is the Calabro Virginia stage, very minute stage, yellow balls producing conidia, and they are mostly seen in, in culture and very rarely in nature. The infection biology was totally unknown because nobody or very few people have seen this stage in nature actually. So it was not seen how shall it cause a disease. <coughs> and this enigma was solved in a way by the discovery of the telemorph stage of Calarifraxinia. So these fruiting bodies, which are now known as Humanoscyphos pseudalbidus, were discovered and they are formed on the petioles of ash in the litter. And there was confusion because originally the thought was that this Humanoscyphos albidus, which is a native fungus and known since the mid 1900s. So it was described in 1851. So that was really strange. Uh, but then in 2010, Swiss colleagues discovered that there are two species. One is native apparently, this is Humanoscyphos albidus, and one is most likely invasive, and that was described as Humanoscyphos pseudalbidus. So the pattern of spread that suggested an introduced pathogen yeah, was then in a way also confirmed uh, because there was a clear pattern towards, from the east towards the west uh, of the spread of the fungus. And then in 2012, the fungus also occurred in the UK. And it is in a way ironic that in the same year, uh, the last big puzzle uh, was published. Uh, the fungus was found in Japan, or it, it was actually discovered that it has been known in Japan since 1993. Uh, around the same time when it appeared in Europe, uh, or was seen in Europe, and it occurs in Japan on Fraxinus manjurica uh, without causing disease symptoms. So this is very, it's very a good indication that Timonoscyphus pseudoalbidus is actually native there and an alien invasive species in Europe. Yeah, to say now most of Europe has been conquered, so to say. Uh, and only Bosnia joined the Kalara Club in 2003. Very likely, yeah, there's a new record from Bosnia which was made this year. So most of the continent is, um, is invaded by Humanoscyphus pseudoalbidus. Uh, it's just parts of France, Spain, and southern European countries that are not affected so far. The blue area, by the way, shows you the distribution range of Fraxinus in Celsius. I would like to show you the fungus. Uh, it has two names, two stages, and the stage uh, it is referred to most common in the UK is Calara Fraxinia. This is the asexual stage, and you see photos here. These photos show uh, fungal isolations, and you see clearly when, when you have early symptoms and isolate from early symptoms, it's now, with looking back, it was very difficult a few years ago, ago but now it's relatively easy to obtain it in few cultures. So you see here four pieces uh, from early symptoms, and four few cultures. And in culture, the fungus forms its uh, anamorph. So you see here culture that has been incubated at cool temperatures. And when you do that, at the margin of the colony, uh, the calara stage develops. So, so cool temperatures generally favor the development of the calara stage. And here you see again the fialophores and the fialids and the conidia. Few of you have probably seen this stage in nature, actually. It occurs also, also on the petioles uh, of ash in the forest litter, on, in the soil. And if you look here, I had one step in 2008, before Humanoscyphus albidus and pseudoalbidus were described. I, I, I found it quite commonly on petioles uh, in the forest litter, and this, they were especially common on these abscission um, scars of the petiole. Yeah? And sometimes also found, found, them, found uh, these stages covering the whole petioles. Yeah? So uh, it's likely the same habitat where the fruiting bodies of Humanoscyphus are formed. The stage which has even a more complicated name, Humanoscyphus pseudoalbidus, which is especially difficult for German native, <laughs> native <laughs> German speaker to pronounce in English, Humanoscyphus. Uh, so we say Humanoscyphus in German. Um, Humanoscyphus pseudoalbidus, this is the name of the sexual stage. Yeah? 
And um, this is, from my perspective, I only now use this name for the H. diabetic pathogen. I know still that Calarifraxinia is more popular in the UK, but it's usual habit in forest pathology, mycology, to refer to the sexual stage. So these, sta these scrutiny bodies of feminine scrupulous are not formed where the symptoms occur, but they, they occur on the petals in the leaf litter. So the leaves are shed, and then over the winter time, these blackish structures called pseudosterosia are formed, and then in the next season, scrutiny bodies appear. And what makes a difference is this, these blackish substance, blackish uh, structures, the pseudosterosia, they form over winter time all on the petioles. And in fact, this is the fungus, these are fungal structures, and later on, uh, the fruiting bodies are formed during, um, mostly during summer. And one aspect, you've probably also not seen this, in rare occasions, this apothecia can also be formed on woody tissues of Fraxinus excelsior. It, it is rare, but it may be of significant epidemiological importance uh, in terms of spreading the pathogens to other areas. Uh, our understanding of the disease cycle and the infection cycle, infection biology of, of H. diabetes is that, that the cholera stage doesn't play any role in the spread of the fungus and in infections. So they are, they are viewed as so-called spermatia only serving as fertilizing agents during sexual reproduction. Yeah? Uh, we, we did some inoculation experiments with the cholera stage, never got infections, and we also never saw these spores germinating on artificial media, very much supporting the idea that they are spermatia. In contrast, the very important stage for the infection biology and for the epidemiology is this humanus typus pseudoalbidus stage. So the spores are most important or are the decisive element in infection biology. You see the fruiting bodies again. You see here these spores, single celled, have us usually having lots of oil droplets. And if it works, no, it doesn't work. And if, if we have time, I can show you later. I, I, have a, I have a video where you see the ESCOSPOR release, yeah? but if it doesn't work, we, we postpone it to the end if there's time. Yeah, I have a video where you could see the spores emerging from this building body that you see visible without a microscope, these spore clouds flying. Um, so it, the general view is that uh, the spread of, of the H. diabetic disease, um, the spores were very important yeah? on the continental scale, and they are the decisive element for the infection biology and to cause infections. However, there's good evidence from many countries, circumstantial evidence of course only, that the transfer of plant material played some role. Yeah? Uh, Jan Stanley told me from Sweden, there's good evidence that uh, the disease came to Sweden with seedlings because uh, ash has never been grown in Swedish nurseries and it may be that uh, it the seedlings were purchased from, from Poland, yeah, it is, is a very good hypothesis. And also in the UK, whether it came naturally or not, plants were, of course, also important to bring in the pathogen to the UK. And that this might have played also some role within Europe, on the continent. Uh, I wanted to show you some data for Austria. I tried to collect some information, some data from Austria. And the only significant trade flow with a European country in terms of seedlings is with Germany. Yeah, you know Schleswig-Holstein is a major producer of plants, also nursery plants, and in the forest reproductive material database in Austria, uh, it is documented that there was substantial flow uh, move, movement of ash plants to Austria. So you see from in 2003, for example, three, uh, over 300,000 plants came to Austria. And in total from 2003 to 2010, there were 800,000 plants. Uh, of German provenances, and in addition, over 200,000 or nearly 240,000 plants of Austrian provenance. So the seeds were brought to the Holstein ground there and came back as plants to Austria. Yeah. If we consider that the records in Schleswig Holstein, I think I have an official record for 2005, but I also saw some data that the first records were made in 2002. 
Yeah, which may be true because, uh, or maybe likely, because also in Denmark the first rate flows were made in 2002. And if we think of this trade flow, look here at 2003, 4, and even 5. And the first trade flows in Austria were made in three provinces, Salzburg, Lower Austria, Upper Austria, you see the points. Um, not, not the detailed localities, of course. Uh, but this, these are the areas where edge is usually planted. Yeah? And the records were made on edge, on, on inner deforestation, some planted edge. And I think this gives some great circumstantial evidence that this could have played also a substantial role in spreading the disease or spreading the pathogen from northern Germany to Austria. And the interesting thing is Austria had first problems in 2005, and in 2006 uh, it was already widespread. The disease was already widespread. In contrast, in, in southern Germany, in Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg, the first records were made much later. So in Bavaria, I think 2008, and in Baden-Württemberg, they could be traced to 2006, I think. But massive disease was only seen around 2009. Yeah? So some circumstances. Like so we should not underestimate the role, although we say now spores were the important aspect for the spread of Hymenoscyphus pseudoalbidus. We should not forget about plant material. One aspect I also want to touch briefly is the wide diversity of symptoms associated with H. Okay? It is, in a way, a very unusual, unprecedented disease uh, in terms of the tissues that are colonized and of the tree parts that are colonized. Yeah? Um, most obvious to us are those symptoms, necrotic lesions on the shoots, um, cankers that we see, and we refer to this disease as a dieback disease. Typical is also this discoloration that you see adjacent to the damage in the bark, resulting very often in, in girdling of the tree and in wilting. And only later these symptoms uh, were recognized, some, somewhat later, leaf symptoms, and these leaf symptoms should not be misidentified with this simultaneous wilting, mm -hmm. but they, they are resulting from escospore infections of the leaves. Yeah? And the first you see are usually symptoms on the leaflets, on the leaflet blade, on the leaflet veins, and then also on the midrib of the leaflet, <laughs> growing into the petiole. And likely also the petioles can be infected directly. And then you see wilting symptoms, so the petiole becomes infected, wilting, and then the fungus can grow also into the shoot. Uh, so, so these leaf symptoms are also thought to be central for the infection biology of H. dieback, uh, and they're also thought to be the major infection path for the fungus to grow into, uh, into the shoot. And finally, a very unusual symptom um, that has been seen for a long time in connection with H. dieback are these basal lesions, root collar lesions, yeah? at the base of the tree, and initially it was said that these are symptoms of hypophthora infections or end of amylaria. Those two still could play a role, but there is at least one study from France suggesting that these symptoms are also primary symptoms of H. Dieback. So I recommend to, to you in the UK, watch out for these disease symptoms. Usually they appear only after a while, after several years. As the fungus colonizes an area, infection pressure becomes higher, spore loads become higher, and then you see the symptoms. Uh, watch out for them, they will sure also appear. And I can say for Austria that in some stains, especially younger stains, you wonder a bit what is really important, the crown damage or, or the, the root color lesions, yeah, because they are so abundant. And there were data from France reporting that only 3% out of 2,400 assessed trees neither had significant crown damage nor had root collar lesions. Yeah, so this is an, a very important symptom. And although it is still debated whether Humanoscuphus pseudoalbidus is the primary cause of these symptoms, uh, my opinion is yes, yeah, but others may disagree with me. All of these symptoms have been in a way linked to Humanoscuphus pseudoalbidus to the H. dieback pathogen using fungal isolations or end molecular detection methods. And based on this information, I would like to draw a, a general disease cycle of H. dieback, uh, which I think is universally or unambiguously accepted. Some aspects are still the source of much debate. Yeah? 
So same to the, to the, to the Z cycle are these S, these keratinthia, uh, apotinthia, sorry, these drooping bodies. They produce ascospores. These ascospores are disseminated by wind and infect primary the leaves. So you see these leaf symptoms. And it happens, although this may be a rare occasion, uh, occasion yeah, but if you have thousands and thousands of uh, infections, even rare occasions may be important. In some occasions, it happens that from the leaf, the fungus can colonize the shoot, so the, the woody tissues of it. And you see here a petiole that is uh, necrotic, and the necrotic lesion has quite come very close to the shoot. Yeah? So this is the way how the fungus can grow in. Then you see, starting in late summer, early autumn, you see distinct lesions. Uh, and if you, if you watch them, watch out for them early enough, uh, what is quite characteristic is that the lesions appear around leaf scars, yeah? pointing to this uh, infection pathway. A Steinbeck has a long incubation period, so many symptoms remain latent, unseen, until the next spring. And we have some good evidence from observations in forest nurseries that it can take until June, maybe even a little bit longer, before you see infections resulting from the last year. Yeah, because uh, there's no spirulation between, um, between January and May, I would say. So it's very likely that the symptoms you see in June result from the previous season. And then the observation in Austria was suddenly, out of nothing, in spring you saw massive symptoms of h also pointing to this very long incubation period in the disease cycle. And this contributes to the death of the tree. Please note it's different to Dutch elm disease. It's not a single infection that kills a large tree. It's the massive load of infection pressure year for year that gradually leads to decline of large trees. Of course, smaller trees can die resulting from one infection only. Yeah? But for older trees, it's really this mass massive attack year for year that finally leads to decline and eventually also sometimes death of a mature tree. The shoots are in most cases a dead end for the fungus. Yeah? So uh, pointing also um, pointing also that to the, uh, to the general view that this is a system of a non-native pathogen with a native host that is not coevolved. Yeah? So the shoots, normally you don't see sporulation and you see here some black dots. So lots of other fungi use the opportunity to form drooping bodies on, on the tree and to sporulate. The main cause uh, for sporulation are the petioles, which become blackish during the cold season. Then the drooping bodies are formed. <coughs> and then there's another, probably a pathway, we are lenticels to the root collar. So lenticels were suggested um, as infection pathway. And this also contributes uh, to the death or to the decline of trees uh, when these root collar lesions appear. And then there's a minor cycle, I would call it, that is displayed here. Sometimes it can happen that fruiting bodies are also formed on woody tissues. And of course, they can also then incite leaf infections and probably contribute a little bit also to these root collar lesions. Yeah? This may not be important in the normal case where the fungus is established, but this is very important when seedlings are brought to new areas there's some sporulation and then the fungus can establish a new area. So for the UK, this, this is probably a very important element of the disease cycle. A few facts I would highlight, just three, very quickly. I'm taking too long time, I fear this because I have a very complicated slide. Um, one fact many may not be aware of, the petioles can support sporulation not only for one season, but for several seasons. Yeah, I have personal observations that they can support the growth, the formation of fruiting bodies for up to five years. Yeah? After five years, it's only scarce, but for two years, you see quite massive sporulation. So at least for two years, uh, they can sporulate. And in a way, Immunoscubus pseudoalbidus forms an inoculum reservoir in the forest soil or in the forest litter. Another uh, fact highlighting this long incubation period, we bought a lot of seedlings from nurseries for uh, infection, for inoculation experiments. 
And you see this result. We had around 500 seedlings. They were visually disease-free in, in autumn 2010. And in the next spring, about half of them, more than 40% of them were symptomatic, yeah? pointing to this long incubation period in the disease cycle of H. Diabetes. And then you see, well, you might say this is quite common, but these were carefully collected pieces, incubated under nice conditions, kept moist, kept warm, and then you see massive spirulation on them. But this is a rare, but very important, I think it's the explanation why bare root seedlings, bare rooted seedlings can serve as a pathway to move the pathogen to new areas. Although it, it's not very common. These, for example, you see them at the root collar, at the root collar, and these were natural infections. I saw them in the field. The, other, the others are incubated. And finally, uh, a, a symptom observation study that supports generally the life cycle and the disease cycle of H. Uh, this was done by Peter Krisch, who is a doctoral thesis at our institute. And he observed around 600 seedlings on a monthly basis from March 2011 to October 2013. So he knows the biography of these seedlings during this period and looked for new, se for, for new in symptoms emerging. Yeah? So he knew when he saw a symptom at one time, it was not there in the previous month. And then he noted uh, the position of the lesion. And he got this uh, distribution. About 40% were located around side shoots. So the fungus grows in, into the stem from side shoots. Around 20%, 18% were associated with leaf scars, pointing to leaves as the infection pathway. 20% were no longer determinable because the lesion has spread too long. 4% were in the internode, yeah, but they, they still might, may have emerged from the leaf scar above. And 4.6% were associated with physical injury. Yeah? So maybe wounds also play some role uh, in, in the infection courts. But the very surprising thing, what you see these 11% that I have left open, in 11% we had strong evidence that the infection started in fact from the root region. You see here a side root, and this was clearly below the soil layer. Soil layer. So I think it may be questionable whether really lengthy cells are the infection pathway for these root collar lesions. In our opinion, it's possible that infections by Humanus cutus pseudoalbulus also start in the root system. So it may also be a root disease. I think, yeah, it may be debatable. Some may not believe me, but uh, we have really good observation uh, to suggest this. And we also could confirm the presence of Humanus cutus pseudoalbulus by molecular methods and also by fungal isolation. And if you take only one nursery, one fourth <laughs> of the infections of the symptomatic seedlings had root infection. So meaning that the infection entrance was below the soil level. A very quick slide. We will speak about that also. The hope for ash dieback is, or for ash, you know, not for H. Dybeck, for H is. Uh, H. Dybeck has a nice time presently, or Humanus cutus pseudoalbitus. But the hope for H is resistance, and Eric and others may, will talk about that. We also see that in Austria, you see here the results from a recent thesis done by Christian Feinschlag. Um, and he assessed in the seed orchard various genotypes. So what you see here, the different, different genotypes. Here you see the damage level, ground damage, ranging from almost nothing to around nearly 90%. So lot, huge variation, which is evident in all investigations that have been conducted in Denmark, in Sweden, in Germany, in Lithuania, and also in Austria. So there is hope that there is a level, some level of resistance in ASH against the ASH type pathogen. So you see here the best clone and the worst clone. Uh, one aspect from what I showed you before is question mark are these root infections. So we, we really don't know whether trees that are, have limited crown damage are also able to, to be resistant, to resist infections in the root region. And I think this puts a lot of question marks and may mean that the impact of H. diabetes may even be higher than it is presently recognized. I could not be here with uh, 
with funding from several sources, national funding. Steve is here, the ISAFOR, the EU project was very helpful to con conduct research. And I would also acknowledge my, our doctoral and master thesis uh, students who did a lot of work, um, which made it possible that I could present you a synthesis of uh, the infection biology, the disease cycle of H. fiber today. My closing slide is referring to northern mythology. Yggdrasil is very popular, you know, the tree of the world, but it's questionable whether this was not a Paxus Bacata tree. Another story that is told is um, in, in the Nordic mythology is that the first man was made out of an elm, out of the first woman, sorry, I apologize, and the first man out of ash. So we may discuss during the break, break whether this has, uh, whether there's a meaning in that uh, in terms of tree diseases. Yeah? At least we can say now man and woman are treated equally. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. We have not very concrete information for that. Uh, I think the usual, uh, the usual sequence is that uh, it becomes deteriorated and then it is removed because it, it looks bad. bad yeah? So therefore, for safety reasons, it's removed. I think if you prune it and take care of it, it, it can survive for a very long time. So if, if you think of veteran trees, I think in the landscape, I'm not, I'm not too worried about their, their, li their lifespan. Um, although they don't look very pleasant. But if you take care of them, I think they can survive for a long time. Uh, one problem is uh, simply safety reasons. So, for example, with big problem in Austria is if you have these trees on, on the long streets, yeah, it's, really, it's really very dangerous. And then the authorities are on the safer side to cut them all down because if an accident happens, it's very, very difficult then, regarding responsibilities. Do you think the first observations are the same thing as the first time of arrival? And if not, what sort of lag phase might we be expecting in the UK? Um, it's likely not the, the time of first observation. The information I got from a Polish entomologist is that in 1992 it was already widespread. Yeah, so widespread damage could be seen, recognizable to the forester. Uh, so some symptoms, I guess, uh, must have appeared earlier, but we just overlook. How long that is, is, it's very difficult to say, but I would say at least five years or so would be my, but, but this is, you know, a, a guess, and I guess it will never be really proven. I think we should stop now for coffee. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Uh, for the